Over 20 years, CNU and its members have used the principles in CNU's charter to promote the hallmarks of new urbanism. As an organization, CNU Utah strives to educate its members and the public about the mission and purposes of CNU, initiate projects and programs that further the purposes and principles of CNU, advocate for the purposes of CNU and further the application of CNU principles in communities among members, allied professionals, civic leaders, and decision makers. Uh, we support membership in implementing best practices and projects while also working to recognize professionals who exemplify and advance the purposes and principles of CNU. We see our ongoing webinar series as a way to both educate and advocate the mission, principles, and purposes of CNU and new urbanism. Extremely fortunate today to have with us for this webinar Chuck Marone and Joe Minicozzi. They'll be speaking to us on the topic of the economics of urbanism. Before I turn the time over to Chuck and Joe, I'd like to introduce them to you. Chuck is a licensed civil engineer, side land use planner, author, broadcaster, and influential thinker. He is the president of Strong Towns, a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Minnesota. Chuck's passion is working with cities and towns on issues of economic development, land use, and engineering, particularly those places that are seeking answers as to why the standard orthodoxy has failed to create prosperity for them. America's approach to growth has transformed these rich in history, ingenuity, and character into places that are financially fragile and socially frayed. Chuck works to restore the greatness of our cities and towns by reconnecting these places with their historical development pattern. He's also striving to bring back the basic principles of financial resiliency while stressing the importance of community in the measure of prosperity. Minicozzi is the principal of Urban 3, which consulting firm of downtown Asheville, North Carolina, real estate developer, public interest projects. Creating U3, he served as executive director for the Asheville Downtown Association. Before moving to Asheville, he was, he was the primary uh, administrator in the form-based code for downtown West Palm Beach. I'm trying to do two things at once here. I forgot about the, the intro slides. Um, he was a sought-after lecturer on city planning issues. His work has been featured by the Congress for the New Urbanism, the American Planning Association, the International Association of Assessing Officers, and new partners for smart growth conferences as a paradigm shift for thinking about development patterns. He's a founding member of the Asheville Dine Center a nonprofit community design center dedicated to creating livable communities across all of Western North Carolina. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Miami and a Master's in Architecture and Urban Design from, from Harvard University. It is also of interest to note that Chuck and Joe are the inventors of Stroding, which capturing a photo of an individual lying down in the middle of a street road hybrid. You can easily recognize a strode if it is wide enough to land a medium-sized commercial airliner. Chuck, maybe you can explain why it's always Joe lying in the strode. Um, what, what, what's up with that? Lastly, um, please keep your microphones on mute so as to minimize the amount of audio disruption during the presentation portion of the webinar. Assistance with this will be greatly appreciated. If you have questions, um, they can be submitted via the chat tool of, of the Web, WebEx uh, uh, browser tool, or you can use Twitter at hashtag CNU Utah. Joe and Chuck, the time is yours. Um, Let me pass you the, the presenter rights, Joe. Okay. And uh, can you see the title slide? Or monitors? Right. So, um, you have to. You may have to accept. Okay, I got there we it. go. 
Do you have uh, Do you have my title slide up? Okay. The floor is yours, Joe. Okay. Um, who, uh, somebody's got to go on mute there. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Just under everybody, please uh, please mute your microphones. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so, okay, th th this presentation is going to be a little bit of a recap for some people. I saw it's a pretty broad list of folks. Um, so some of it's going to be what I presented at the uh, Congress for New Urbanism up in Buffalo, but I'm also going to go through as uh, there's a broad selection of folks on uh, the list. I'm going to touch on a little piece of stuff for everybody, um, but I want to start with a little story about, about me. Uh, I grew up in Rome, New York, uh, on the Erie Canal, um, a town that was decreasing in uh, economic potency when I was a kid. And um, to show what the sad state of my hometown, they market it by what it's near. So, like, if you're in Buffalo, why not take the three-hour drive over to Rome to check it out? Uh, there's really not a whole lot of there there. Um, the high point for Rome was the start of the Erie Canal happened at Rome and went east and west from there. Um, so this infrastructure project that ha happened. Um, if you're ever saying the Erie Canal song, you talk you sing about my, my town with the mule name Sale. Uh, this is what my town looked like back in the day. And in the 70s, it went on some hard times. Um, and, uh, they figure out what to do with it, and somebody came up with the creative idea. You, you all remember your Revolutionary War history and pivotal fort of Fort Stanwix that was basically based in my hometown. Um, so in the 70s, out of desperation, they tore in a big chunk of my downtown and built this, uh, all this stuff basically got ripped out, and uh, we got this Revolutionary War fort. So this is in the middle of downtown, or what used to be downtown. And um, we get a Canadian tourist, um, and that's it. Um, if that wasn't good enough, they took the rest of downtown. They built a pedestrian mall. Um, they built a couple parking garages because you know everybody's going to show up to town now that we built it. They'll come. Um, they put a plaza on the pedestrian mall because apparently that wasn't enough open space. Um, this three-block long pedestrian mall, a new hall. Whoever's not on mute, could y'all go on mute uh, just so that we don't get feedback? I'm getting a lot of noises from somebody in there. Um, so the City Hall, they built a first parking lot in front of City Hall because the parking garages weren't enough. They built a mall on the other side of the highway, and then they built this really crazy Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio, some concrete mall thing that shot out over the and connected to the mall. Of the 180 businesses that were in this renewal area, um, only 18 of them turned this area. So basically, so what was downtown and um, wiped it out. Um, so we've got this mall, um, and it, I thought this was normal. I thought this was what happened in cities. I, I, you know. Here I am in my high school picture with my permanent mullet. Um, I headed to Miami, um, and at that time, uh, urbanism was talked about in the architecture school. Um, and Liz and Liz and Andreas were professors of mine. It's kind of fascinating to me that I realized communities were doing this, that they were actually growing. I was just used to communities dying. Hey, I didn't under, understand that. Okay. Um, I just uh, is it came right now. Uh, if if y'all could be on mute, that'd be great. Um, so that you know, we all know the story. We all know what was going on with this um, inhumane landscape that we were building for people. In a way, it's it's almost cartoonish. But the sad thing that we all know inside the CNU is that the real places uh, like this, San Antonio, Texas. Um, just during the college, I actually went to another room. I went to this one, uh, Rome, Italy, and. I Actually, um, in this apartment building on Campo di Fiori, uh, to school over in this building, and I ate here. So, dealing with this, these two dueling Romes, my hometown of Rome, New York, that's dying, and it's Rome that's been around for generations, thousands of years, that's reinvented itself, 
and the choices did, did this really make that got off alive? And how was it that my room was dying? And in the context of it all, there's a history of how cities operate and have genetic material. So in a small town, hopefully we'll grow up to be a, a larger town, a bigger a, a city, a bigger city, and, and so on. That they have, there's a genetic stream between Provo and Salt Lake. There's material that connects them, much in the way that there's material inside my body or DNA. So I started, uh, when I started my life, I was three months old, and this is what I'm going to become. I'll become my grandfather, whether I like it or not. So that genetic material, this me, him, or more importantly, this guy, my dad, um, is important to me. And I have, I have genetic issues. I'm genetically Italian. I like to eat. And we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. I have to do things in my body today to not have that seven bypass heart surgery my dad's gone through. Or I can continue my habits and get overweight and had a heart problem. It's me. So we'll have, cities can look to their grandfathers. They can look to Rome. They can look to Salt Lake and find issues to to deal with it. Conversely, Salt Lake look to places like Chicago and New York, et cetera. And we do this. That's what we do for planning, right? In Asheville, um, our company was birthed out of Public Interest Projects, which is a real estate development company by Julian Price in the upper left. And 70% um, of the money in Public Interest Projects goes into the sticks and bricks fixing buildings, and we reserve 25% to start businesses. It's a $13 million portfolio. It's got to function as a cash flow. Our costs have to be covered by our revenues. It's that simple. Uh, basic level, we do renovation. This is one of our buildings before and after. Um, it's an apartment building with um, a, a, an old hotel that we converted to apartments above retail and around in the basement. Um, but really, when we look at these buildings, we're seeing a cash flow. We're seeing them like crops. That a buildings, in a way, function like like a farmer looking at a field. There's a there's a productivity, a flow that has to happen. A farmer doesn't go out and just farm the entire field. They need they do a financial calculation about what cost to fertilize it, to water it, to the crop, and then get the crop to market and what the crop yields. Per acre. And once that calculation, then they go out and farm. They don't farm the entire field uh, just to see what they can do. They've got to make it work financially. The cities, and we're kind of known for this chart, uh, comparing two buildings as a crop. So one of our buildings on the right, this very building, mixed use, and cash flow per acre versus what ha happens at the Walmart. And when we look at buildings, we tend to see the overall value, but we, we neglect the fact that it's sitting on dirt, and that dirt is the normative uh, common denominator. So when you do that and you run the numbers, you see the potency effect of that downtown building on a per acre basis versus the Walmart on the left. We'll, we'll deeper into this, but I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you all in this story by now. So for us, the city is, this is Asheville. It's just a, a finite boundary of land. It's got a, it's got a, 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 it's got, a, it's a container holding acres and how those acres cash flow are critically important. So we had this question by saying, what is a city? But in case Asheville, my hometown, my current town, is a portfolio of about $10 billion of value. If summed all of the real estate of Asheville, its taxable value is $10 billion. It's a real estate portfolio of $10 billion, which puts it at the scale of being three times the of Donald Trump's portfolio. So about cities, as we talk about it as, as a piece of urbanism, we need to understand the role that it plays as a cash flow. And Donald Trump to know his costs and his revenues. So we should be doing the same thing. Um, I like to use this quote from Michael Bloomberg, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If we're not putting those numbers out there and designers and planners and uh, in landscape architects and architects, if we're not putting that number out there, we're doing a disservice to our petitions for making these decisions. So um, it's all across the country and mashing up the numbers, this is kind of what we see. For every dollar of, of tax productivity somebody out in the county in their house produces, somebody in the city is paying about eight bucks to the county in taxes per acre. The Walmart's about seven bucks. So it's notable that a city resident is producing more revenue than a Walmart. The mall's about double Walmart. A story building's about $77 an acre.
acre in county taxes, a three buildings, about 119, <coughs> and so on. <coughs> What's interesting about this chart are two things: is that it's not a proportional growth. You stack stories; it's an exponential growth. This start happen. <coughs> and number two is note that I I wrote this chart as the county property tax. We conscious of the fact that cities sit inside counties, and they pay county taxes as well. So what we've found time and time again, that urban core, that downtown, is a handsome producer of revenue for the city, but it's also a handsome revenue producer for the county. So what's good for the town, great for the city, but it's incredible for the county. Um, <clears throat> now realize this isn't complex stuff that I'm doing here. This is pretty simple stuff, just normalizing all the data in land. So what you'll see time and time again in our studies, we do a per acre analysis to normalize the analysis to force what cities are, which is just lumps of land. Um, we already do this in other forms of, of efficiency. When we look at cars, we don't rank cars on miles per tank, do we? And if we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. But but we know that's silly because all gas tanks are different. So when you do it on the gallon of gas rather than the tank of gas, the numbers change, and we'll be driving BMW Assetas if 70 miles per gallon. Now, this is a joke. Be cute about it. That because we we understand that gasoline is what drives the car. Well, land drives buildings, and there's so much land to go around. It's actually much more finite. Well, it's about as finite as gasoline. Um, and doing this for a four dollar commodity, we certainly should be doing it for a forty thousand dollar commodity. But is how do you bring this information to the decision makers? How do you get them to see the data and evidence to increase their ability to make better decisions in their community? Understand the urban environment intuitively and from a design practice. Ultimately, we need to get the decision makers to understand the financial ramifications of their decisions. So uh, through technology and different technology can bring different data. So if we have x-ray technology, I can show your hard tissue, I can show your skeleton, your muscles even. Um, we can do the same with an MRI, um, and you see soft tissue, or even three-dimensional resonance imaging of brains. So with GIS, GIS technology, we'll the same tool or the same method to see different data. So let's just, we just recently finished um, Austin, Texas, uh, Davis County, um, and this is the value per acre of the county, um, which is looking at it. But if we go in 3D, it's a little bit easier to see where town is and the potency of downtown over the entire county. Uh, this is one way of seeing the data. And oftentimes, I'll ask the community, I'll just say, you know, point out downtown to me, and it's easy. Um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out where it is. Um, just looking at the sea limits inside the county, um, again, we see where the Density is growing northward around the university and the orange stuff uh, left of the purple spikes. Um, the idea is very, we find very effective. We also use this method called cartogramming, where you re, you contort the two dimensional shape to map you. So in this case, this is a map of from 1921 of energy sales in the United States back in 1921 in New York to the big energy seller. So it's big. It's a big image. You see um, uh, Utah's number 29, so it's 1 29th the size of New York. So if we do the same thing with the model, go back in and do the value per acre and then distort it as a cartogram, this is basically the side-by-side. -side. So you see down that actually has that little, little print county from a land area standpoint it has a potency of about 72 times its footprint. So it's another way to visually demonstrate the potency of an environment and what it means to the county, the entire county. Incidentally, for those of you that don't know Travis County, all that stuff on the left of the map to the west, the squiggly river with a bunch of lakes, the incredibly valuable real estate, very large footprint tracks. So you have this wealthy part of the county there's a lot of real estate. Individually, those parcels are worth a lot, but when you aggregate them and divide them into the acreage, it, it almost disappears. Um, it's just very expensive infrastructure, uh, high tax bills, but it doesn't cover the nut. 
Um, you may think about retail in different states. The policies are different. In Texas, we could get the retail taxes by zip code. Uh, Travis County is the bluish area in the center. And no zip codes don't follow borders. They actually spread it out, spread out into about six different counties. So the six county retail analysis of productivity. And again, downtown pops out. Uh, this is the this is the mixed beverage sales. So these are all the drinkers. Um, and then there's this just that we were kind of surprised about south of downtown and across the river that came in Bertu that was actually pretty potent. Uh, again, this is over six counties. Um, this is the hotel sales. What I'm here is noticing the gap between number one and number two. Again, downtown is still um, head of everything else, um, and even more so. This is the food and beverage sales, and again, still downtown Austin um, leading six county area in, um, in retail. And then this is the total combined all sales. Taxes. Now to add on top of the property taxes that we saw earlier, you know, it's down is just um, believably potent. Now, now to the basic level, when you look at individual buildings, those archetypes story. Um, the building, the building on the top slide is B. D. Riley's. It was built in the early 1800s. That building's still worth 14 million dollars an acre of value. It's just a little three-story building. We put that in comparison to a Walmart, you see that just 1.1 acres of that three-story building would equal the entire potency of that 20-acre Walmart. And the pose to folks in Austin was, I think it's going to be here another 100 years from now. It is all about these other typologies. They're essentially designed based around appreciation model. So that Walmart is, is only going to be there for about 15 years. And so you get day one when it opens its doors is the best day that you're going to get out of the, the taxes out of a Walmart. From there forward, it's going to depreciate down to nothing, and they're going to move on to a new site. Again, we need to understand those tax models and those implications that that these building these new current building typologies are just following policies. Um, if you had two acres of the building on the right, the Intercontinental Hotel that was built in. 1909, um, it would equal the entire 172-acre uh, Park Meadows Power Center, which is your Best Buy and Target and whatnot. So, so this two acres of real estate development would equal 172 acres of land consumption. Now, get into the cost of what does it cost to service these things, but you can imagine it's a lot easier to service two acres than it is to service 170 acres. And you don't have to be an old building. This is uh, some newer buildings, and it's not even high rise. This is a, a seven-story excuse building in downtown Austin. Uh, seven acres of that building type would equal the 175-acre um, new mixed use uh, walkable uh, Gria Mall area. So in Buffalo, there were some interesting lessons. Um, you know, it was a city that's you know really got some lessons in its state of decline. Um, this is a community that was once powerful, and now in its fall, what are we learning from it? Even in its model, we're seeing its downtown pop up um, along the along the so the Lake Erie there. Um, and you can see the the potency of the Olm Olmstead necklace to the north of downtown, um, as well as the uh, the fabric of its community. So its three dimensional model laid over downtown, we can see it this way. Um, the potency of downtown. Immediately in the foreground, we see a neighborhood that suffered a tremendous amount of urban renewal, never came back. So it stays at this low value of, of greens. Now, we're trying to convey that visually to the audience to get them to understand what's happening financially. But it's nice to see that they're downtown still holding its value. Um, in outlying towns like Williamsville, even in these smaller towns, their main streets uh, really run off the page. And again, even in a town that's or a region that's a region of decline, we're still seeing the potency of property taxes in the downtown, their areas. Um, they actually have this area called Amherst that's still suburbanizing. But it's, in essence, the population is cannibalizing itself. They don't have um, new people moving into the region. They're just shifting the population around. But even with that, downtown's succeeding. And at a retail standpoint, 
and they're down. For those of you that went to the CNU, um, there isn't a whole lot of things to do in the downtown, and it pretty shuts its doors at 6 o'clock other than the uh, attainment district stuff. But it's doing quite well from a retail standpoint. Um, to combine the total taxes, you see that the downtown succeeds. So just to run through a couple of examples, um, and again, it's easier to see these in, a, in an area of decline. You have the, the malls and the Walmarts. The, the malls about double the Walmart in value. Um, and I'll go ahead and bring the Walmart back in a second. But these are malls that are dying. So you see that they're down 128,000 of value per acre, and the new stuff is somewhere around 500,000. So you start to see finally what happens with depreciation. And it happens much faster up there because they're losing population. Um, some street stuff, a new building on the upper left, but even the older stuff in the lower right, it's still quite handsome in its productivity, uh, 3 million an acre. And um, just right of the slide, you can see I've kept the Walmart value per acre on so you can keep it in context. Um, Buffalo is absolutely littered with unbelievable pieces of architecture. You have the Campanile Apartments at 4 million an acre on the upper slide. But what's amazing are these little uh, parks that were built in the 20s, a uh, townhouse row called Mayfair on the lower at $6 million an acre. Um, and some old buildings in the downtown that are unbelievable at uh, $25 million. And put that in context, that's a, a fairly modern high-rise on the left at only $10 million an acre. Um, so I'll tell you in the last teen architecture, the old architecture, that folks build the, the, the building see that, that hangs around. Uh, this is my favorite building in Buffalo, the, the guarantee building. Um, and so here you are with this building built in 1896 that still has a portfolio value of 25 million an acre. Now, what I mean is just the detail and ornament that's on this building. It, it has left a cultural value, but also a financial potency um, for over 100 years. So um, 0.7 acres of the building on the upper left would equal the entire 102-acre mall. Um, and you know, you can ask yourself, as 100 years from now, which one's going to still be standing? Um, this is that little townhouse on the upper left. It, five acres of that would equal the 102-acre mall. There's also a tale of transit um, in Buffalo. We thought it was kind of funny that their big sprawl road was called Transit Road. Um, so we, they also, they're also the smallest city that has a subway. So we compare subway in the TOD areas. So we did these, this TOD capture along the subway line, and then went to Transit Road and same boundary capture on it, and said, let's just let them duke it out who produces more revenue. Um, so left we have Transit Transit, which is the subway, and on the right we have Transit Road, which is auto-oriented. Um, what's noble is you see a total value that's higher in the subway, um, but it nets out at about a million an acre of taxable value, where the um, auto-based stuff is only pulling about 100,000, let's say 150,000 an acre. Now, to be underscored here is you'll notice the middle line, which is the percent taxable. Along that transit line, less than 50% of the land area is actually tax producing, yet it's still producing a value of about a million. So that wash over you for a second. There are hospitals, school buildings, county buildings, city buildings, all sorts of non-taxable stuff along that train line. Yet even with that, that burden, you're still seeing the taxable properties producing a tremendous amount of density. A very valuable lesson for transit right there, and transit advocates. Um, we just finished a, a 15 county in Charlotte. Uh, in county, see in Charlotte, which is a huge area, and it's this is the the metropolitan region around Charlotte. And to put that in perspective, this is Rhode Island at the same scale, or it. So you're dealing with an MSA that's effectively an entire state. You know, the same land area as Connecticut, yet its population. Some things we can learn here um, from Connecticut, but but just into the data, this is how it looks as a 14 county normalized. Um, tax model. So you can clearly see downtown Charlotte being the machine for the area, but you start to see these other areas pop up. Um, and it's trying not to be so big city about this, just getting into the smaller towns and how fabric kind of pieces together. We're aware that smaller municipalities uh, feed into that system. 
and the corporations unto themselves. So just getting into a couple of those examples, um, let's kind of get into there's a region of rural stuff further and further out. And one of the worries here is rather than just totally depend on shit, what if other communities really focus on themselves and growing themselves up? So going back to Connecticut, surely Charlotte is going to be the bird. Who's going to be New Haven? Who's going to be Bridgeport? Who's going to be New Canaan? And in the regional conversation, we, we sometimes forget that, that we can actually grow ourselves up. Uh, so looking at Huntersville on the north, and we're going to come over to Matthews in a second, but let's start with Huntersville. Huntersville passed, or is, is, is encouraging a lot of walkability. And this is, this is straight from one aerial. So you see within um, a half mile of each other, we've got walkable, a walk, and we also have a, suburban, a conventional suburban center. We went ahead and net out the taxes of what each produces a per acre basis and just let the math tell the story. So we have um, about $20,000 of tax production on the left in the misuse use center and $14,000 of taxes on the right. The story here is you get what you get. This is, this is it. This is how it works out. And your elected officials need to, need to see this. We need to bring this information to them. And this is what it looks like. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Would there have high spikes or lower spikes? You know, if you don't if you don't get the math of the numbers of cash, show it visually. Now, the town of Matthews, further out from Charlotte, at the edge of the county, is doing some interesting things. This is a community of 10,000 people out here. This model you can see is a downtown, right in there, and just in and comparing a couple of housing typologies, um, basically pretty close to each other, um, equidistant to the main core of downtown. You start to see visibly the difference in taxes in the model in the upper right. And running the numbers of the townhouse, uh, the mixed use center versus the conventional cul de sac, um, this is the value proposition. It's about $9,000 of taxes per acre versus 2024, 20, well, three, let's say. So, what the, what the elected officials in Matthews understand is that density produces revenue and wealth, and they've actually kind of gone so far as to try to encourage policy to reflect that. I'm going to close on an alternative example. You know, I did a lot in my work, this whole, well, people want suburban environments, and that, that's fine. That's their choice. But we've always had pieces of that in our models. We've, and when we did Gwinnett County, Georgia, we were given a, almost a pure example of suburban sprawl in one county. Um, Gwinnett County is over from the core of Atlanta, at the time we were doing the study, they kept on telling us they were rural, that they're not the city of Atlanta. We're this rural county. Well, working at it from Asheville, we're only, we're in a, I'm in a city of 80,000 people, and I'm looking at their county, and their county is 800,000 people, which is lowing. But when you look at the data, see that Gwinnett County, Georgia, is indeed less dense than DeKalb, which is where Atlanta is. It's 1,800 people per square mile, uh, from the left. My county is second from the bottom right, Buncombe County. So here's my little old town of Asheville inside of Buncombe County. We're at about 350, 000, or 350 people per acre. But look what's in between us. Between Gwinnett and Asheville, we have Charlotte, Nashville, and Raleigh, all dense than Gwinnett County. And what I mean is they've produced density, yet haven't made a city. Now, what is financially, is that on the far right, their peak value, their highest value inside their model is about 8, eight million acres. My town of 80,000 people has been able to achieve up to 46 million of value acre. Chapel Hill has achieved more density wealth than Gwen. And then I wander to the left and you see Austin, Lynn's Austin. Austin's about 1,000 people per square mile Gwinnett is almost double Austin's density. So of Glottal, we didn't see a spot in the center. We typically spot a heat spot. And this is kind of like a big yellow kind of haze for the whole entire county. We turn the model sideways, and we're like, where's the spike? And this is, this is it. It's like a big, big, thick carpet. They have spread their value completely horizontal, which meant they picked up all that horizontal infrastructure. This is what we typically see. This is Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Hillsborough. And you see the bikes of their main streets in each of them. 
So that ism is reflected financially in their choice. Just to lay the three counties side by side, Nashville, Austin, and Gwinnett, again, are the same relative density. Actually, Gwinnett is the, the highest density. This is their it's the um, heart monitor to see the economic pulse. See where these models peak out. And this is, this is Gwinnett County's choice. If they want to be horizontal and stay flatline their value, great. But they can only do that so long before they start running out of money to pay for that infrastructure. And they have a choice. They can either densify and grow, cultivate new wealth, or they can raise everybody, everybody's taxes. That choice. But just to kind of close, um, you know, bring data to folks, help them make decisions. Um, the data is agnostic. It just says what it says. And, and realize value that Asheville is a $10 billion corporation. You know, if we're, we're more valuable than the Jazz, we're about two and a, two and a third times the Jazz. And uh, Miller knows Gordon Hayward's towel bill. You know, making financial decisions in this sport, we should be making a financial understanding of the choices in our city. And that these aren't invisible market forces, they're all driven by policy. We understand the cost of eating, I understand at least, the cost of eating a bag of potato chips. I can see my fat content, the sodium content, and I have to act accordingly. I like potato chips. I also like key lime pie, but I eat key lime pie every single night. So I have to start a diet to maintain my longevity into the future. And really critical for Salt Lake City, um, Michael, we're talking about inversion. You all know this effect. You know what's happening with people with those choices. I mean, no, you not only have a financial problem, you have an environmental problem, which will become financial sooner or later in, in pollution that gets trapped in, in your area because of commuting patterns. So your folks, do the math. Um, these are the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. Your policies can actually hurt you. And hopefully what Chuck and I can bring you is a little bit of mathematical experience to kind of help tell the story. And that's the presentation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um, I uh, to look at the other side of the equation. Uh, a guy who looks at the the cost. Um, you're looking at something else. There we go. Uh, my name is Chuck Marone. I'm the president of Strong Towns. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how cities make investments and what kind of some of the assumptions that go into those. Right today, there's a huge incentive for cities to build new things and to create new growth. And we're having a competition in this country, uh, in every state in the country, how do we create growth? How do we create jobs? To use three primary mechanisms, to use grants, loans, subsidies, uh, and different types of tax incentives from the federal government, transportation spending, uh, we use private sector spending, largely debt that is used uh, to create growth. And for us at the local government level, this is a good thing because when we get new growth, we get new tax revenue. Uh, this is running the 101, uh, kind of a Pavlov's dog kind of response here. We get new growth, uh, new tax revenue, everything is good. It's important to step back and understand the incentives that we have at the local government level. Uh, that make this Pavlov's dog type of response to new growth. Uh, the initial cost for that growth is generally very minimal. The federal government, the state government has a program or a subsidy. When the T comes in and does a project, when the developer comes in with leveraged capital, uh, when they come in and get mortgages and what have you, the cost for building this stuff uh, is generally, you know, borne by someone other than the municipality, the taxpayer. The benefit that the taxpayer gets, however, is substantial. All of a sudden, we have all this new growth, all this new tax base, all this new tax revenue coming in, and it didn't cost us very much at all. The catch is that, as part of this transaction, we agree that we're going to maintain these improvements forever. We will fix all the streets and the sidewalks and the curbs, the pumps, the, pumps, the valves, the meters. All of that will become a long-term public obligation. Uh, I want to show you just a few case studies that we've done where we've actually 
broken down our development pattern into kind of base parts and said, who actually is this exchange when we look at it over a long period of time? This is a settlement. These are two, two and a half acre lots on a dead end called the sac This is kind of the simple kind of development that you'll find. No commercial traffic, no through traffic. The only people that use this are the people that live upon it. The city built the road, uh, and the cost was $6,600 per property. We just asked the question, when the city has to go out and fix it again, uh, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the money that they need to put in uh, to in this road? The answer is 74 years. The road lasts anywhere near 74 years, but it's going to take the city that long just, to, just from these taxpayers to recoup the money to actually fix it. Uh, this is slightly more intense development. These are half acre, three quarter acre lots, some large lots there on the west side, but uh, you can see they have a minimum of frontage. And this is a closed loop system, uh, dead called the sac we, we like to model those because it's rid of all the ambiguity of, of what is shared infrastructure, what is common infrastructure, what is infrastructure that serves, you know, areas further up the line and what have you. This is kind of one of those end of the line things uh, that should, in three, you know, generate a lot of tax revenue, and, and if things are working out well, pay for themselves. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, they out and had to maintain and fix this road. Uh, it was built in the early 1980s. They just had to fix it a few years back. The cost of $54,000, based on the tax revenue that they're collecting from the people and the properties within this development, it's going to take the, six, the city 79 years to recoup. Uh, what they spent to fix it, uh, raise people's taxes today, uh, so they would have the money. Uh, the next time that road needs fixed, that would require an immediate 46% increase of taxes, and then increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years, with all that money going just to maintain the roadway. Sewer systems, water systems, sidewalks, uh, curbs, these are all vast expensive with vastly greater imbalances than this even. Sometimes you say, well, Chuck, we get it, uh, money on residential property, we make it up on commercial. Uh, for myself, I, I kind of find that to be bizarre. I don't know any corporation that loses money on 90% of its holdings and tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why. An incorporated municipality would think that that was a, a great strategy. Nonetheless, uh, we have this cultural notion that if we just get enough commercial property, uh, we can make good. This is a business park. This is the kind of thing that, that all over the country build uh, to try to attract new growth, new jobs, new business creation. This was built in the mid-1990s. Uh, every single lot in there is completely built out, so this is a you know, you know, wildly successful type of investment. We wanted to repeat it on property they own. Just Jason. So we said, all right, all right, we could build the exact same thing and get the exact same return, exact same level of investment. Uh, work out for us. There's not $1 million is the cost to build this. It's been $6.6 .6 million of investment that's gone into here uh, that generates that the tax base. Uh, for a second, understand that of that $6.6 .6 million, four of those are a church. Two of our school bus maintenance facility owned by the school district. One is a county maintenance garage and one is a city maintenance garage, all of which pay no taxes to the city. The remaining lots, the ones that theoretically are taxpayers, every single one was either sold for a dollar and or was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract these people to move into and operate within this park. Assume for the sake of our analysis that Every new property in this new park would be built out within 12 months. They would all be non-subsidized full taxpayers and that every single penny of revenue would go to breaking even on this investment. If that's the case, which is a wildly optimistic scenario, it would take almost three decades for the city to break even. Decades where everybody else's taxes would need to go up to pay to plow the road and mow the ditches and the streets and provide every service that would be it out here. And that's in the most wildly optimistic of scenarios. Many, many of these case studies, and I'll be at our website address at the end. You can go on our website and look at some more of them. But I want to kind of lay out to you exactly what's happening. Uh, when a developer comes into the city or the federal comes in with a grant or the state government comes in with some type of loan or subsidy or the DOT 
he comes in with a project. Uh, Diddy uh, gets the benefit of that new growth. And this is a cash flow diagram. We're assuming here a cumulative amount of cash flow. So you see here the revenue that the city brings in from this new growth. And what you see is that, you know, immediately there's no cost, just revenue. Uh, the revenue grows, grows, and grows, and accumulates and accumulates over time. And when we get out two and a half uh, decades, uh, what we find is that that accumulative amount of revenue is sufficient to maintain everything that we took on in terms of a long term liability as part of the transaction. And so, from a cash flow standpoint, our municipality was far into the negative. Now, to solve this, and there's a way to deal with this without really having to deal with the underlying insolvency problem, and that is to generate more growth. This is the same last graph that you saw, but that scale of a project repeated every other year. So this is the ideal scenario for a city. Nice, steady, continuous growth comes in. Uh, we have no expenses because everything's brand new. We have all this revenue. We feel very, very, very rich. And we get to the end in year 25, and we have to make good on the promise we made way back in that very first development in year one. We have to spend a little bit of money, sure, but at all this growth that creates what we call the illusion of wealth. It covers up the fact that we are insolvent, at least for a short period of time. The problem is, when you lose money on every transaction, don't ultimately make it up in volume. And the further we go out into the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is cities uh, that have been everything right, and I use right in air quotes, everything by the book, everything the way that they were supposed to do, following every program they were given, every incentive they were asked uh, to take, uh, have found themselves in very dire financial circumstances with vastly more infrastructure, vastly more roads and streets, vastly more obligations of any capacity to meet. One of the ways that we solve this, and one of the ways that we've tried to deal with this as a country, is by taking on debt. Uh, first life cycle, that first cycle of growth when everything feels good and the growth is going well and we have no expenses yet, it's all been just positive cash flow, uh, we take uh, often our growth, and I'll use growth in air quotes again, uh, and reinvest that back into creating more of the same type of development path. Time, what happens when this doesn't pay for itself is that we ultimately wind up shifting uh, to debt, we we wind up first with short-term notes, and then with mid-term notes, and then with longer-term notes. As an overall economy, we have reflected this. Uh, the line you see here, bottom line, blue is the growth in our public sector debt. Those millions of dollars we talk about every year. Our national debt is huge. It's growing exponentially. It's this overwhelming amount. The bottom blue line, the blue line is our GDP growth. The green, the one that soars up exponentially. That private sector growth that, that we all share. Uh, debt. Did I say growth? I meant debt. That's private sector debt. That's all have. That's home mortgage loans, commercial real estate loans, margin interest accounts, student loans. Uh, we built the first life cycle of this new experimental way of, of building cities on the automobile, the whole suburbanization of America. We did that uh, in the first life cycle by using our savings and by investing that illusion of wealth back into creating more growth. When we second life cycle, those mechanisms were insufficient, and we ultimately shifted from economy based on growth through savings and investment to economy based on growth through debt accumulation. We switched to debt in order to maintain the rates of growth and the levels of growth that we needed to keep everything going. As we know, the third life cycle. Uh, our need for growth through debt accumulation became so important that we actually allowed it to be, become mandatory. We had allowed mechanisms to arise where you not only didn't have to have a down payment, uh, you didn't have to show proof that you had a job or that you could even make the payments on a house. We need to grow so bad, bad we always come to prey on people, uh, our neighbors and others, who really couldn't afford a home or to get them homes that were much greater than what they actually could afford. Our ability to continue this whole experiment by having private sector take on greater and greater levels of debt is simply not there. 
way differently. And I think this is kind of the, the, the critical pivot point we're at right now. We've had seven years of doing things a certain way. Now we have local governments, state governments, federal governments, businesses, developers, financing agencies, and everyone kind of lined up around doing things a certain way. But we culturally have accepted the notion that the way we build our places is the right way, the way that should be built. Yet it's important to step back and understand that this is how we ever built places. In my hometown of Brainerd, Minnesota, back in the early 1900s, this probably looks like a lot of the cities out there in Utah, where many of you on the call are at, uh, this was built uh, not with federal subsidies, not with state subsidies. Uh, this was built uh, largely around a railroad stop by people who didn't have build roads and didn't have comprehensive plans and didn't have economic development initiatives and subsidies. Uh, what they did is they simply took the material they had on hand, resources that they had available to them, and they it, and they copied the development pattern that people had been using for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We have a long history of building cities in a certain pattern form. It's a process and a methodology that is, in a sense, time-tested. And when you look at the way we build things today, and this is the exact same street now, uh, 110 years later, uh, what you're looking at here is a an experiment, a new way of building cities that may seem normal to us because it's what we've grown up in, uh, in terms of the history of mankind, is an incredibly radical experiment. No one has ever tried to build an entire continent uh, where all of our spaces were built around moving and storing automobiles. No one's ever tried to do that. Uh, we have. And we're very young into this experiment, and we're now just figuring out some things that I think may be obvious to some, but are now starting to become obvious to everyone else. Like, for example, there's half a million dollars of public infrastructure in those two blocks of street. What's the tax base to sustain that? It's come from those half-occupied buildings. Uh, where tax base to sustain that public investment? It's simply not there. You can go around to every city practically in this country 